to say welcome, welcome, welcome once again uh, to Snook Assembly of God, where we worship the King in the country. Amen? Amen. That's what we do. And we have indeed worshiped Him uh, this morning, and He has indeed shown up. Amen? Amen. Uh, the beautiful presence of God. Uh, thank you all, and welcome those that are going to be with us at Facebook Live and also on YouTube. Thank you for joining us and listening in. Uh, God bless you. You can turn in your Bibles to Colossians uh, chapter 3. We're going to finish out Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look at the first verse in chapter 4 uh, this morning. What we have been discussing in the book of Colossians is removing our grave clothes and putting on our grace clothes clothes by putting off the things of the world and putting on the things of God. Uh, so we're following up. Uh, the Apostle Paul goes on to speak in Colossians 3.18 about relationships. And he talks about the relationships in the family. But what I don't want us to miss as we look at these relationships in the family, how it connects with our relationship to God. Uh, so this is a beautiful passage of scripture, and we're going to go over that. All in the family is what we've entitled the message today, All in the Family. Have you ever noticed when someone gets saved, when someone commits their life to the Lord in a family, that it not only affects them, but it affects the entire family? When one gets saved, it's, it's uh, pretty common, right? Uh, and, and more likely than not that others will get saved because they will see the change and they will feel the love of God that is being impressed and influenced in their life. When Lisa and I first got saved, her stepdad, his name was Harold. Now Harold was, uh, well, let's just say Harold. <laughs> I think I've said enough. And, uh, <laughs> When Lisa and I got saved and we would pray for the family, how I many of y'all pray for your family? Of course you do. We would pray for the family. And when I would get to Harold, I would just say, Lord, just whatever you can do there would be great. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what I, I mean, you know, it, whoo, you know, but anyway, <laughs> Harold got radically saved because Mindy invited him to church one Sunday. And he went to the church at Gideon's First Assembly of God and got radically saved. He was, he was radical and weird on this side, and he was radical and weird on this side. <laughs> but he's in heaven now, glory to God. Amen? And, and I can remember shortly after Lisa and I committed our lives to the Lord, Brian, our son, uh, got radically saved. And uh, he said, now... Mom, Dennis, now one thing I'm not going to do is run in church. That's just crazy. I ain't doing that. The very first revival we had at Brenham First Assembly of God, who led the Jericho March in that church? None other than Brian Batchman. <laughs> Don't never say never. Shortly after Lisa and I got saved, we went to Assembly of God Church in Freeport, Texas, and, and we went to the service and had a great service, and the altar call was given. And I was sitting in the pew with Lisa, and, and as the altar call was given, we were all standing, and the Lord impressed upon me to pray for someone that needed to take a step of faith and come to the altar and recommit their life to the Lord. And all I prayed, I said, God, they're here. Don't, don't, don't let them be afraid. Just remove all the fear and doubt and let them take that step of faith. Get out of that boat and walk on the water and go down and receive your love. Tug upon their I was praying. And nobody went. And I said, well, Lord, uh, okay. And, and the, the burden lifted. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Sure you have. And the burden lifted and the dismissal prayer was given. We went home. And when we got home to Lisa's mother's house, Lisa's cousin came over to visit with us because we were leaving back to come home to Brenham shortly afterwards. She came over and she was weeping and saying, I went to church today at another church and the altar call was given and I went forward and recommitted my life to the Lord. 
Amen. Now, isn't that something? That just gives us a testimony of how prayer works. She wasn't in the church we were at, but God was telling me to pray for her in the church that she was in. <laughs> Glory to God. So when we get saved, the influence of the love of God that is in our life and the light of God that is in our life touches all of the rest of the family. The first institution that God formed was the family. It reads in Genesis 1 and 27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replace the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The very first institution that God created on earth was family. God, we thank you. We thank you for family. We thank you for our family. We thank you for those that are saved already in our family. And we are believing you, God, that you'll bring others in. Uh, God, that you would tug upon their heart and you would save them and touch their life as you have touched ours. God, let the light of our life and the love of our life that is inside of us uh, be an influence to them to draw them closer to you. Thank you for family. Thank you for a church family, uh, for our church. You know, we have a beautiful church, and we thank you, God, for our church family and the love that we have for one another. We ask your blessings and anointing over the preaching of your word, the hearing of your word, receiving it, and the walking out of the same. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. So the very first relationship that the Apostle Paul tells us about under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is husband and wives. Husband and wives. Number one, in Colossians 3.18, he talks about husbands and wives. Now, when you think about this, I want us to remember that a marriage is a reflection of Christ and the church. You see, we are the bride of Christ, and we submit to the Lord. See, the, the, Jesus loves the church so much that he gave his life for her. Yeah. This is the love that a man has for his wife. And the church submits to Christ 100% as the head of her. And that's the way the wife submits to the husband. You understand what I'm talking about? So as we go through these scriptures, bear in mind our relationship with God just as important our relationship with our wife. Colossians 3 and 18 says, Wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. Submit as it is. Now, submission is not slavery. The word submit is the same word. I heard the lady say amen. The, the word submit is, uh, is the same word uh, used as a military term, meaning different ranks in the military. Uh, one soldier is a private, one soldier is a sergeant. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other, but it does mean that they have different ranks. It, 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 it would be uh, chaos if there wasn't some order. You understand what I'm saying? And we serve a God of order. 1 Corinthians 14 and 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. So there was a, a chain of command is what he's talking about here as in the military. It doesn't mean that the man uh, is, a, is a, would lord over, but it does mean that he has the responsibility of leadership in the family. The husband is the head. Ephesians 5 and 23 says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church and gave his life for her. He is her savior. Christ is the head of the church. He is our savior. The, the husband in the marriage is the head of the marriage. Leadership in the home, not dictatorship or lordship, 
but leadership in the home is the husband's responsibility. Not only does the wife submit to her husband, the wife submits to God first. Because if she's committing to God first, then she's going to submit to her husband second. Because that's God's word. Amen? And when we follow God's word, when we follow God's plan for our life and for our marriage, we will grow spiritually and we will grow stronger in the Lord. As the wife submits to God and as the wife submits to her husband, she frees herself to be who God has created her to be, to be all that God has created her to be, to be used of God. And as she does that, her home, her family will grow as well, and they will grow in the Lord. And verse 19 of Colossians 3 says, husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. That's an interesting thing. First he talks about love and then he says to be not bitter against them. When you look at our relationship with God, I think this is a beautiful thing too because you say, well, we are to love the Lord God Almighty with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And then it says, don't be bitter against them. How many of you in your life time God has asked you to do something that you didn't particularly want to do, like maybe lead in a Jericho march around the church. I don't know. You, know? <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? Sometimes God asks us to do things that we, you know, I don't know, you know, then you get into the not my will, but your will be done, you know, right? Sure. But we are not to be bitter toward the Lord. Just as he is talking about the relationship between a husband and a wife, he's talking about and he's relating it to our relationship with him. Yeah. Don't be bitter toward God. How many of you have, have had something in your life to where you blamed God Amen. for it? Mm. Let's just be honest. Amen. Mm. Let's just be honest. Okay. Don't, that's being bitter toward God. <laughs> Bitterness is bringing ourselves to live bait to the devil. <laughs> right. we, when we're walking in bitterness, we are live bait <laughs> to the devil. Don't be bitter. That's right. Do not be bitter. So he says here that we are to love our wife with an, an agape love, an unconditional love, a giving, sacrificing type of love, a, a I want to serve you type of love instead of serving myself type of love. Do you see the correlation between our relationship with our wife and our relationship with God? Amen. Same love. And it's the same love that Jesus has for the church. It is. See, the measure of love that a husband has for his wife may not be seen in gifts or words. I'm not very good at either. <laughs> Gifts, oh, boy, my wife, boy, she write on the card, and, and, and I'm like, well, you're writing a book. You know? <laughs> I just write, love you. you know? <laughs> Amen. I, people call me a man of few words. <laughs> Unless I'm here. But anyway. <laughs> but it's seen in sacrifice. It's seen in sacrifice. Maybe not. In gifts, maybe not in words or in song or in a book, <laughs> but it's seen in sacrifice, like for instance, going shopping with her. Now, that may not seem like much of a sacrifice for women, and maybe even for some men, <laughs> but for me, that is a huge sacrifice. <laughs> Amen. To go shopping. I hate to go to H E B and she reads all of those things and those jars and, and cans. And I'm like, would you come on already? <laughs> Amen. And oh my goodness, on and on. But anyway, moving on. But, but sacrifice, washing the cars, vacuuming it out for her. Things like that. 
letting her keep the cat in the house when you would just assume it not be in the house. You know, I'm just talking about a few things. Not saying that that happens in my life, but <laughs> we do have a cat in the house. But anyway, so that, these are things that we are to do, sacrificing, and then we are to like it. That's the hard part. Because it says, don't be bitter. Don't be bitter. Well, it's hot out here. I don't want to go out there because that's being bitter. I just love going shopping with my wife. <laughs> Those are the sacrificing things. Just like we sacrifice and we show our love to God, men are to sacrifice and show our love to our wife and not be bitter about it. I know my wife is saying amen on Facebook right now. Probably she's probably writing it in there. <laughs> ah. Remembering that a husband's love for his wife is a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Let's just remind ourselves. Love is patient when she's reading all the ingredients on that can. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking, not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. Hmm. Just let that soak in. Wow. Man. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with truth. It always protects men. That's right. It always trusts. It always protects, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. Love our wives. The wife will have no problem submitting to a husband that loves her this way because she knows that he has her best interest at heart and would do anything for her. Just as Christ gave his life for the church, she knows that this man would give his life for me. We are to love. So in a marriage, we must see love and respect. That's the two cornerstones of a marriage is love and respect. A husband's love shown through sacrifice and a wife's love shown through submission. And there will be harmony and there will be happiness because that's God's plan for marriage. We must work at a marriage. I remember the first time I heard that I thought, work at a marriage? That's ridiculous. No, I was the one that was being ridiculous. <laughs> we must work at a marriage. That's what we must do. Seeking to serve one another instead of seeking to serve just ourselves. Amen. For there is selfishness. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be division. But where there is love and respect... There's going to be harmony, and there's going to be happiness. So, well, that's a, that's a truckload of stuff for us men. I feel like it's a more of a truckload for men than it is for women, but the women may think otherwise. <laughs> Where do we get that power to be able to do that from? Well, as we've been talking about for the last two Sundays, removing those grave clothes, removing those clothes of the world and putting on our grace clothes, yeah. the things of God and realizing that we can do all things through Christ that gives us strength. Amen. So that's the husband and the wife. Did you catch? I don't want us to miss the relationship between us and God in that. Did you catch some of that? Number two, parents and children, same thing. Parents and children, we are the children of God. 
So when we look at the relationship between parent and children, we don't want to miss where we see the relationship between us and the Lord as well. It goes on here and it says in Colossians 3 and 20, children, obey your parents in some things. <laughs> That's the way I read it when I was a teenager. <laughs> In all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Remember, we read in Genesis 1, 28, that God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. So the normal result of a marriage is children. <laughs> so that's a wonderful thing. Now, I was fortunate to be raised in a Christian family. A mom and dad that loved the Lord, gave their life to the Lord, and a granny and grandpa on both sides that loved the Lord, gave their lives to the Lord. I was so fortunate to be raised in a Christian home. Maybe you were raised in a Christian home. Maybe you wasn't raised in a Christian home. James, I'm going to ask James Kemp to come. James came over the other night. I was telling you, he and Linda came over and and James shared something with me and, and uh, just talking. And I said, James, you know, I'm going to be preaching on something very similar to this on Sunday. Would you mind giving us a testimony of this similar thing that happened to you in your life, speaking of not being raised in a Christian home? Thank you, James, for, for giving your life to the church and sharing it with us. I had to write it down because... It's so confusing. <clears throat> but I'm going to read it to you as best as I can understand it. I didn't know a lot about my early life until I got to talking to my Uncle Tommy and Ruthie. They're the two people that, when I was a small child, they were involved in my life. But what happened, it's, it's really confusing, but I didn't know anything about my young life until I was about, oh, two. And what happened, my mother <laughs> took us to Florida after uh, my little brother got thrown through a plate glass window and uh, to, to get away from, to me, to get away from the law. And we lived in Florida. And my mother snuck a letter to the neighbor woman to mail to my grandpa Kemp in Michigan. And what the letter was telling my grandpa to come and get us because we were in trouble serious trouble. We had this, what you call a baby, infantile on our hands and our feet and our face. And she couldn't do nothing about it because of my stepfather. So she said, my grandpa kept me come down to Florida and got us. And for the next two and a half years, we lived with my grandpa Kim. Old fashioned Baptist preacher every morning. Woo! You were going to sit in that pulpit, I mean, in that chair, and he was going to read the scripture, and you were going to pray. Every night before you went to bed, you were going to sit in that chair, and he was going to read the scripture, and you were going to pray. Because he, he set the foundation. Well, here come my mother. One of us kids, my grandpa said, it ain't going to happen. So she goes and gets a court order and comes and gets us. Take us to her mom and daddy and then leave us for two more years. I mean, no, no real foundation except for my grandpa Kim. And and you don't even I don't even want to tell you what happened for the next 68 years. The the the, the pain and the, the hell that we went through, me and my sister. And then what, Monday? Tuesday. Tuesday. I get a phone call. Linda said, honey, you got a phone call today. From who? Your Uncle Tommy. 
Can you believe that? My sister, Ruthie, my aunt, saw my sister on Facebook and got in contact. And then Tommy called, I called Tommy. And it was so funny because I called him. He said, uh, I said, is this Tommy Kim? He said, yeah, who do I have the pleasure of talking to? <laughs> he said, I said, this is Jimmy Kim. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and we talked and we talked. And then Ruth, I called Ruth and we talked. And we got this first eight, ten years of my life together. If you can believe the confusion it was. But what I'm trying to say is, the last thing Tommy asked me, he said, are you saved and <laughs> serving the Lord? Um, that foundation that he got to my grandpa killed right. 68 years later. Yeah. He's asking me if I got that same foundation. <laughs> Family, I've always tried to raise my kids to the importance of family. Because down here, that's all we had. All I've ever had is church family. And her mother. I love that one. But family. And I prayed the Lord that my grandpa kept coming and got me when I was two years old or less. I don't know. But he gave me a Christian foundation. Amen. I thank the Lord for it. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. 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 His uncle Tommy was his dad's brother. Yes. And isn't that amazing? We had the privilege, I had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. James, not so much. But God intervened. You did. Every time. And brought him and gave him the foundation that he needed yeah. in his life because God saw James Kemp and he said, Man, I got some things I'm. I need that guy to do. <laughs> yeah, he He's it. got just the passion right. that I need. He's got just the strength that I need to get this done over here. But I got to get him in a place he can get some foundation <laughs> taught to him. And God intervened and brought that. And yeah. you probably have a very similar story mm -hmm. to God intervening and bringing you Amen. to the cross. That's the love. <clears throat> That's the love. As we talk about children, I believe we would be amiss not to mention that we all believe that every child has a right to life. Amen. We are pro-life. And the sons of God and the snook assembly of God. There is a particular party that does not believe in the right to life. They are not pro-life. That particular party, and the reason I can bring this up is because this is a biblical issue. This is not a political issue. I'm bringing up a political issue, and I want to unmask the fact that there is a party, and it is the Democratic Party, that believes in abortion, and they believe in abortion all the way up until the ninth month, yeah. and some even after the child is born. You can have the baby disposed of, terminated is a better word. That's murder in any of those categories. That's murder. So when you do vote, and we're not allowed as uh, ministers of the gospel to be talking about political issues from the pulpit. But again, I say this is a biblical issue. This is a right to life. Every child has the right to life. Amen. Amen. So when you go to the polls, I want you to think about that, pray about that, and vote the way that Jesus would vote. Yes. Amen. I'm so proud of my son, Brian. Uh, he is a builder, construction company. And one time he had a job to bid on. He went to bid on the job. And it was a pretty big job. It was going to really help the company. And he found out that the building that they were building was an abortion clinic. He turned and walked away and he said, the company I work for, the company that I represent, will never build a building that murders children. Amen. Not only does this particular party want
to legalize all of this, but they want your tax money to pay for that. That's a biblical issue, let me remind you. That's not a political issue. I want to make sure everybody understands that. <laughs> children have a right to life. And children have a responsibility to obey their parents, not just to obey in some things, but as we read, in all things. Just as we are to obey the Lord in all things. The child uh, that... Uh, doesn't learn to obey their parents will not obey others in authority like teachers and, and uh, police officers and, and judges. And that all starts with the parent right. having the right relationship with God. It all starts with the parent. A parent that, that does not submit to God that is trying to teach their child to submit to God that's not going to work. We are the examples. That's right. So it starts with us setting the example, submitting to God, and then our children will submit as well. Then in Colossians 3 and 21, it says, uh, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Again, discouragement, a lot like bitterness, is live bait for the devil. A discouraged child, a bitter child, is, is live bait. Yes. <clears throat> the word fathers here in this scripture can be translated to parents. So it's talking about both. Do not provoke your children. In other words, make it easy for your child to obey. Yes. Too often we just say no without listening to the child uh, and giving the child any time. We just say no because it's easier for us to just say no and move on. That's going to bring discouragement. It's going to bring bitterness into the child. Take the time to explain to the child why. Why? Now, my daddy's why was because I told you so. <laughs> And my daddy would say amen. <laughs> but my parents would explain the why. It's important. I like this, uh, the way Paul puts it in Ephesians 6 and 4. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instructions of the Lord. I think the reason I love this verse is because when Mindy was growing up, Every time I would tell her no about something, she would say, Dad, you are exasperating me. <laughs> I don't think she knew what that meant. But anyway, <laughs> parents must be consistent with their children. Don't be no one day and, oh, well, that's okay the next day. We must be consistent. God is a consistent God. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. It's, if it's, it's, it's no, it's no. <laughs> There's not a time that it's yes. It's no. Parents need to spend time with their children, just like we need to spend time with God, because we are his child. We need to spend time with God. It, it's okay for kids to know that we're busy, but they also need to know that we are taking time out for them, just like God is going to take time out. Parents must have a listening ear, just like God has a listening ear to us and a loving heart. Uh, you know, uh, God's never too busy to hear our cry, is he? And, and that's the way we need to be for our children, just like God is for us. Life isn't easy for a child, especially in 2020. It's not easy. And we think, oh, you know, the problems that they are bringing to me, they're so minute, they're so small. Y'all just need to not worry about that. Would you like God to tell you that? <laughs> Would you like to go to prayer and God say, what are you coming to me with that for? Get out of here. I'm busy working. I'm helping Dennis over here. He's over there. <laughs> <laughs> he has a listening ear and a loving heart towards us. And that's the way he wants us to have for our children. God cares about everything that touches our life. And that's the way he wants us to be for our children. No matter how old they are. Amen. No matter how old they are. Amen. My dad still listens. He's 91. I'm 65. He still listens. 
We need to pray for our kids and encourage them. That's right. Discourage children that we've already said it. They're live bait for the devil. Y'all are fishermen, right? Y'all know what a live bait is, right? <laughs> Amen. If a child can't find the love and the care and the listening ear at home, they'll find it somewhere. Parents uh, should help their children develop their gifts and talents. Uh, just like God helps us to develop into what his plan for our life is. We need to see that in our children. I know my mama always told me, he said, there's my preacher boy right there. I got three kids and one's going to be a preacher one of these days when he grows up. The problem is it took me a long time to grow up. <laughs> but I finally grew up. <laughs> Bless God. Don't compare your children. Don't say, why can't you be like, mm. God's not going to compare you with somebody else. He loves you just the way you are. Don't be comparing kids and say, I wish that. Don't, don't use your kids as weapons against one another. Kids will pick up on that quick, and they'll learn to manipulate. Don't teach it, your children to manipulate. No matter how old they are, no matter how old you are, don't teach your children to manipulate. Teach your children to love. Teach your children to care. If the home is a Christian home, the child will find a loving heart, a listening ear, a helping hand, and encouragement and strength for the battles that are ahead. A place where his needs are met. The third thing, I just want to say again, thank you, James. God bless you for that, Amen. sharing that with us. The third thing that the Apostle Paul covers is masters and servants. Masters and servants. Let's just read a little bit of this in Colossians 3 and 22. He says, servants obey in all things. Here that all things is again. Your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. In other words, not only when they see you, but when they don't see you. <clears throat> this relates to our integrity with God. Well, you know, I'm in Las Vegas. Whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know? <laughs> no, God sees. <laughs> uh, God sees. Maybe your pastor don't, and maybe you, your parents don't, but God does, right? Even when they're not there. And whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive a reward of your inheritance. So you may not receive the reward here on earth, but you're going to receive the reward from heaven if you submit. But he that doth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons with God. And in Colossians 4 and 1, it says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. In Paul's day, the wealthy had slaves. And slaves had a great deal of responsibility. They were mostly educated, and they had a lot of responsibility. They kept up with the home, they kept up with the ground, and they kept up with the children as the children was growing up. So they had a lot of responsibilities, and there was a lot of trust there. So why didn't the Apostle Paul openly oppose the slavery that was going on? And instead, of, instead, he just instructed them. Well, the reason why is because the gospel needed to be preached. And that was the Apostle Paul's focus, was preaching the gospel. He may not have opposed the slavery, but he did tell them in 1 Corinthians 7 and 21, were you a slave when you were called or when you got saved? Were you a slave? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. So he's encouraging them. But here we don't have slaves. And the principles that Paul taught uh, are applicable uh, to an employer and an employee. And, and, and very applicable is our relationship to the Lord for the work that we do for God because we are working 
for the Lord. Amen? Amen. So we look at this. A Christian worker should obey and not argue. Uh, we should do what the boss said to do, whether he is there or whether he is not there. When God tells us to do something and calls us forth to do it, we should do it and not argue with God about it. Now, I've been guilty many times about arguing with God about it, but God always loves, and he's always going to be there for us. I, I would say to God, you know what, oh, God, I, you know, are you sure? <laughs> but as we grow in the Lord, we're quick to obey. Yes. Just as we should do with our employ, employer. Now, you don't know what to say if your employer ever catches you asleep, right? You know what to say. You, didn't, you know, you're sleeping and he catches you. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> That's the way we handle that. So, <laughs> we ought to be the best worker on the job. We ought to be the best worker on the job. I know when Brian got called and, and when he joined the Air Force, he wanted to do this over here. And, and he said, but I got to load planes and I'm not going to be able to do that. They told me I could do that. You know how the military is. <laughs> they told me I was going to be able to do that, but now I got to load planes. And I said, Brian, you be the best cotton picking plane loader that the Air Force has ever seen. And God will grant you the desires of your heart. About a year later, he was able to do what God had called him to do. Just work as unto the Lord. That's what we ought to do. We ought to be the best worker on the job site. Amen. I remember one time I was working for Brown and Root at Shell Research Center in uh, Sugar Land. And Brown and Root built that complex years ago. I'm, I'm aging myself now, aren't I? But uh, <laughs> uh, my dad was a superintendent. And he had hired me as an electrician's helper. And uh, I was working, and I had a journeyman, and the journeyman had left. And uh, he said, I'll be right back. And so I just sat there on the floor. You know, I was, you know, 19, 20 years old. And I was just kind of throwing the screwdriver back and forth, you know, just kind of sitting there on the floor. And about that time, I saw these nice, shiny pair of black shoes. And I had that hard hat on, you know. And so I looked at those shoes, and I heard change rattling in the pocket. I thought, uh-oh, that sounds like daddy. <laughs> I looked up. <laughs> and there he was. And, and uh, he handed me a broom and said, you know, you're getting paid to work. You're not getting paid to sit down. We'll talk about this when we get home. That's when I, I learned the motto of Brown and Root, uh, walk fast and look worried. <laughs> you need to be busy. You know, when I think about Jesus, he says, he says, you ought to have known I was going to be busy about my father's business. You know, we need to be busy about our Father's business. He wants us to work for Him. He wants us to shine our light. He wants us to show our love. That's being busy about the Father's business. Amen? Amen. Just as a husband and a wife and children and parents have responsibilities, the boss, the employer, and the employee has responsibilities as well. Christian employers must treat their employees fairly and honestly. <clears throat> this was a new idea for the Romans. They hadn't ever looked at it like this before because the slaves was property to them. They didn't treat them as people. They treated them as things. We're not to do that no. with people. God died for people. God didn't die for policies. God died for people. Yes, he did. And he loves them that much. And we ought to love them the same. So the gospel didn't free the slaves of Paul's day, but it certainly changed, the gospel certainly changed the relationship. He says in Galatians 3 and 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, 
For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And there is no respecter of persons. We are to treat one another like brothers and sisters. We don't call each other brother and sister just because we forgot your name, although that happens sometimes. <laughs> We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we ought to treat each other that way. Love one another, submit to one another, obey the Lord, and treat each other like family. Amen. Because we're family. Amen. We're family. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us in your word a beautiful relationship between you and us. Between us and our spouse, between us and our children, between us and our employee, employer. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much that you gave your life. If you are here today, you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to make that commitment today. You can just say this simple prayer with me. Let me lead you in a prayer and make Jesus Lord of your life because he wants to be your Savior today. Just say, thank you, Jesus, for tugging upon my heart. I realize I'm a sinner. I've done wrong, and I need a Savior. I believe today that you died on the cross for me, for my sins, for my wrongdoings. You took my penalty, the price for my sin, and you paid it for me. Thank you for doing that, Jesus. And today, I confess you as Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for being my Savior, and I make you Lord. And it's my desire to live for you from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Let's just take some time to